Welcome to this evening's uh, scrutiny committee meeting. We have a number of councillors here from off the committee, so welcome to everybody. Um, so that's good. What I will do first before we start is introduce Lorna. Lorna Ford, who is our new Deputy Chief Executive, so it's on her name plaque. Good evening. Thank so, you. Welcome, Lorna. Um, I, I will also say, um, I don't know if you know, but uh, Lisa's uh, off council at the moment. Uh, her mum died last week or the week before. So obviously we send our best wishes to Lisa. Uh, very difficult time for her, I'm sure. Um, and with that, we can carry on. Uh, first item on the agenda, minutes. Do I have your authorisation as chairman to sign the minutes of the meeting held of the, on the road for the scrutiny committee held on the 22nd of November 2021 as a correct record of those proceedings? Agreed. You agreed? Thank you very much. Item two, apologies and substitutions. I do believe we're actually all here. Did we correct this? Um, apologies this evening, Councillor Jones. Ah, Councillor Jones. Yes, indeed. Um, and no substitutes. Additional agenda items, there are none. Um, disclosures of interest. Any members feel they have any disclosure of interest they need to make up? Chair, personal interest in item six on the member of East Sussex Council meeting. Okie dokie. Can I assume that goes for you, Council Maynard? Not me. Councillor Clark. And you're not on there anymore, are you? No. Oh. <laughs> oh. Councillor Kirby Green, do you wish to declare the same interest as a county councillor? Yep. Okay. We just cover it off, just in case. Um, okay. <laughs> right. Uh, that's on that only disclosure interest. Yep. Uh, item five: key performance targets, 2022. Uh, resolved. The overall and scrutiny committee review the current performance targets and set out in Appendix A and the new KPIs and agree and recommend to cabinet. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. So, um, yeah, within this paper, obviously, in Appendix A are the current key performance indicators uh, that are being used for the, the financial year 2021 to 22. Um, it, effectively, this paper is, is just explains the outline position of the current KPI set um, and really much gives carte blanche to, to this committee to determine what they want to recommend up to cabinet uh, for next year's set. We have outlined the current five <laughs> themes which are housing and communities, economic development and poverty, waste collection, additional income, and planning for performance. The, uh, the, um, the environment strategy in, in previous years was, was talked about having a, a sort of carbon footprint indicator, and it was made clear by cabinet that, that they would like to see uh, some sort of carbon footprint indicator into the next KPI set. Obviously, it's for this committee to decide whether or not to recommend that, but that was a request from Cabinet in previous meetings. Um, and uh, with, you know, in, in previous uh, iterations of this, there's, there's been an often debate between what's the state of the district, if you like, you know, and what the outputs of, and, and the impact of, of the work that you do versus what is performance of council function and, and uh, whether or not you wish to, uh, as a committee, recommend one way or the other or strike that balance as we tried to in the past again is, is is down to you so really we're uh, we've sort of assembled the, the the various service managers and heads of service to help guide the debate but at this stage other than outlining what was being uh, monitored in previous years we're not making any specific recommendations as to uh, what the committee might want to consider for next year's targets I remember to switch this on every time uh, um, well, I think that's um, as Ben said. So basically, it's over to you. Um, I understand. I know that Polly um, contacted me yesterday with regard to the environmental um, movements and, and the 
have been um, council building as well. So obviously if that's come from cabinet, then that's something that we should be looking at. And I think it's covered all service managers now have to cover it in that lockdown. So maybe as a as a you know reporting tool then we should have it. Um you wish to speak to it, Karen? Well thank you, Chair. Um Ben, I was just concerned about the KPI for the waste um re recycling is at fifty two percent. And I did wonder whether we could raise that as well. But then I had a quick look at the DEFRA um, racist figures, and to my horror, I saw that the average for England is 41.4%, so compared with that, we're doing quite well. But in the southeast, um, the highest is South Oxfordshire at 63.6%, and the lowest is Dartford at 24.5%. But I did wonder whether we could aim. Or is, it, is there anything we can do to help increase that rate of recycling? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, I would say that we're not quite meeting that current 52% target. Um, so there is there is still work to do. I think when Deborah was correct me if I think we're around about 48, 49%, are we, Deborah? Um, so we're not quite meeting the existing target as it is. So I still think there's some work to do. If you want to retain um, that as an indicator, then what we'll probably look to do is review that target and whether or not it's achievable and, and what would need to go into that to, to be able to achieve it. Thank you, Chair. This is a difficult one because we've got the UK Environment Bill coming out at some stage with secondary legislation. And those that are getting the higher recycling percentage are those who are doing food recycling um, and um, Perhaps more garden waste recycling, that, that sort of aspect. So it will change quite a lot when we start getting into that secondary legislation and understanding when we'll be introducing um, those changes as well. So that will have a big impact. Um, in the meantime, we will work to get that recycling percentage as high as we can. Yeah, thanks, Deborah. I think. Uh I think what Councillor Gray's sort of concern is, or, 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 or she sort of indicated to me in her email, was in the future we, we're supposed to be looking to recycle up to 65% or more, or 65% or minimum. And, and so she said, well, should we set a target at 65? But then the trouble is, you, if you know you can't get it, you look like you've, you, you, you come across as failing. But then the argue argument is instead of looking at failing, you should, should should you argue that you're at setting a target that makes you look as if you're attempting better things. But so so would a, a sort of compromise position be if we're waiting for government legislation to come out and say you've got to do this or you've got to do that, is that the time to then review the KPI, the target, because you've got you've got a bit more ammunition at your hand. You've got to collect food waste, and you've got to collect some of the amount, and you've got to change that. Then you can up your up your figure. Because if you haven't got to do it, then you know you don't know. Do you? Yeah. Councillor Phil, I'm sure you've got a view. I do have a view about recycling targets, and I think the targetry around recycling is extremely difficult. If you think about the waste hierarchy, it says reduce, reuse, and recycle. So you shouldn't be using it in the first place. If you do use it, you should be reducing it, or you should be reusing it. Um, and only as a last resort should you be recycling it, and as the very last resort, you put it in, in the residual waste. So if you have any sort of a target for recycling, the higher it is, and the more waste you're actually encouraging, because you're discouraging from reusing or not using it in the first place. So I, mean, I don't know what the answer is, and I suspect the government will make us have targets. But I think they are completely meaningless because you should actually be discouraging any form of throwing away, even into a recycling bin. I'm not sure how I answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should go back to the 70s when all their milk came in a glass bottle and then we never threw away a single milk bottle because it was absolutely drawn off. Absolutely. And it came on an electric vehicle. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I've got an issue which has been 
grew up with my, my residents, I'd like to get some clarification on Robert's policy. It's regarding the recycling of batteries. Now, I saw on a website, they reckon there's 11 million batteries bought at Christmas. They could be for children's toys, could be anything. My understanding is that the trucks have a separate compartment for collecting batteries. But a lot of my residents are saying, although they're told to put a, li a little bag on top of the bin, that they've witnessed people lifting the bin and boxing and chucking it straight in or ignoring it. Now, do we have that policy? Are we, are we succinct and clear that we, we encourage your residents to collect the batteries, right? And are they viable to collect? And how do you recycle them? Because it, there's, no one seems to be quite clear what our policy is on it. like the, uh, the finger of blame is heading towards your way, Deborah. But I always understood that batteries were put aside because they can catch light inside the vehicle. And from the last thing the contractor wants is 140 grand worth of lorry at the side of the road on top. So, um, anyway, Deborah. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you for that comment. We had um, a complaint quite recently about that exact subject. And um, we took it to Vicar because it is a breach because of the fire regulation put batteries knowingly into um, into waste, and they looked into it. And the CCTV cameras demonstrated that the the operative had not put it into the green bin that they had um, put the batteries in. They put it around the side, and the CCTV showed that very clearly. So we fully investigated that, and any other similar complaints are fully investigated because that is. You know, not a good thing to do for, for that very reason. So the protocol is that they, if they collect the batteries, sometimes the bags are missed. That's another issue. But generally speaking, you know, any electrical goods or, or batteries, they're put in a separate bag on a container and they're taken and put in the um, cage at the side of the vehicle. Um, they're all put in a very large container in the depot. Um, not aware of the exact recycling of them, so I can find out. Say, so, you know, do this or do that. But frankly, if I have batteries and we collect them in a little tub, I have to take it to the supermarket. Why should I have to take it to the supermarket? Because there is no, as the councillor said, there is no. Plan. There is no strategic plan by the district council to collect batteries per se. And maybe there should be a little pocket in the new bins for batteries only. You know, it, it, we're not doing anything. I mean, uh, that's what I've been doing for years. I've been taking them to it. And I do have quite a lot of batteries, probably because my wife likes lights around the house. <laughs> she turns all the Christmas lights to think about spring. So, yes, we do use a lot of batteries, Chair, and uh, I think we want to have to have a plan. To you know, I, them I can understand, understand your feelings, and I have the same, actually, but I think we're veering slightly off API info, let's put it that way. Yes. Yeah. I'm perfectly honest, but, uh, but there it is. Um, Councillor Barnes. Uh, leave those two on one side. Um, I wanted really to make three points. Uh, one on housing. I, I still find it very difficult that we're treating housing supply overall as a target when we have very limited control over this and where we all know we're giving more planning permissions. Uh, so the gap between the build-out of houses and the planning permissions we're giving has widened. So it seems to me uh, to set ourselves an impossible goal there when we have no way of influencing house building uh, makes that a, a really a meaningless target, unlike the one for affordable homes, which I think we have got a degree of control over, and therefore that's a meaningful target. Um, where I really want to concentrate, though, are on the two at the end. Um, first of all, on additional income. I've been looking back at where we were 
planning to be at the outset of this term in terms of generating income. Um, and we should have been at about 2.5 million at this stage. Um, so it seems to me we need to set a slightly more ambitious target. I'll come back to this a little more when we get to talking about uh, budgets and our recommendations to Cabinet. But it does seem to me uh, that when you're about a million short of what we were hoping to attain, uh, to set a target uh, this low, um, given the financial situation we're facing, is really um, not very sensible. Uh, when we come to planning indicators, I'm getting increasingly uneasy at setting planning indicators that are way beyond the statutory uh, requirements. We've invested, Anthony will correct me if I've given the figure wrong, we must have invested about the best part of 400,000 a year in consultants at the moment. 370, I think, to the four. Um, but I don't know whether the new planning manager, acting planning manager, in that figure or not, if not. Uh, but if we've invested that amount of money, and we are making substantial progress, so I'm not critical of uh, what is being done, but it seems to me that we're slightly betraying that investment if we set uh, these kinds of figures, which frankly send the wrong message to uh, developers. I'd really like to be a bit more ambitious. Um, those are my points, Chairman. Uh, just a couple of bits on the, uh, the, the, the planning bit, really, if I may, uh, Councillor. The current indicators are 91 days and 56 days for the major applications and minor applications, respectively. That's the, it, it is odd because we've done it in days rather than weeks, as somebody pointed out to me earlier today. Um, they are actually 13 and 8 weeks, uh, respectively. So that is the statutory time scale. So we have set the current target of 91 days and 56 days at the statutory limit. Um, the statutory guidance is what we are. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's, it's just the way I've styled it in there. It doesn't. It's not overly clear, is it? <laughs> the um, uh, just uh, on, I think with regards to how much we've spent on on not including obviously the interim development manager post who is made up from existing salary vacancy, so not it's not an additional cost. The, the, the approved uh, spend on capital is about 250000 I think. So it's, it's, um, but it's still a significant amount of money, and we do expect to see some significant improvements in timescales as a result of that. We are still far away from this target, if we can trust ourselves. <laughs> but we are, we are getting there. Um, in terms of the uh, additional income one, I'll probably have to defer to Tony if I may, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ben. Uh, the income to uh, target, I believe, in this report, and uh, rightly of course, I'm not uh, entirely certain, but I think that covers the uh, rental income from across the uh, council's um, uh, portfolio, if you like. So uh, I think what you might have been referring to, Council Farms, is the um, income derived that, or that we've since generated from the property investment strategy. <coughs> so. That figure is usually report or is reported routinely to audit and standards committee and as part of the treasury management report. And I think I'm right in saying off the top of my head the uh, the current budget for this year for uh, property investment strategy related rental income is about getting on for a million nine hundred and sixty three thousand. I'm grateful for that clarification. I I must admit the asset income figure I'd taken to be our property investment figure. In which case, I think actually, uh, for reasons which I will explain under a later item, I think we do need to set a, a target for that and a stretch target for that uh, because we are now lagging well behind the financial strategy we set out at the beginning of the four-year term. Um, I think there are, that's giving rise to considerable problems. So I would, could I suggest we put a property investment income target in there?
anyone else, would the easiest thing to do to say, if you're happy with Appendix A, um, which are our performance indicators, so if I, if I go through them, housing and communities, um, I think it's important to keep hold of number of households in temporary accommodation. Um, the average length of stay is better. Um, it is there. Uh, number of households on the housing register. Net additional homes built, which helps that. A number of affordable homes to live in. So are we happy with happy with that one as a start, Ben? I'll make it. I think Councillor Barber's comments seem to be suggesting that maybe the, uh, the housing for the ones Performance of the council rather than being something that we are concerned with in terms of getting the most out of the housing project. Yeah, would you like to see Councillor Barnes number five, which is the affordable one? Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that, would that be monitored by planning council? Uh, yes, well it's, it, it is, and it's also monitored through the housing authority of Devon. Um, so it's not something that we would think that we would be handling it through the housing authority. It's monitored from both the service and by the planning council. Okay, it's, it's not going to disappear, disappear from the So would we have to be, oh, Councillor Coulter? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my concern is about targets one and two. Um, I think uh, while right to have those uh, targets, the number of households in TA and the average length of stay in TA on the list, but I think the current target is a little bit ambitious, particularly as um, there are massive increases in energy costs. Um, price inflation is at the highest for a number of years. And there's been a uh, reduction in universal credit. All those factors together tell me that there's going to be more pressure on temporary accommodation rather than less. And I think those targets should be increased to be realistic. Um, I'd very much like to hear what um, Joe Powell has to say on that. Yeah, I think it's a question of really whether we're looking at indicators or targets, really. I've always found it slightly odd that the, the number of people in temporary accommodation is described, and I know Councillor Barnes has spoken to this, but be, be described as a target. So I think it's an indicator, though, more generally, of, of the um, system as a whole. But it, it, it's rather redundant without the prevention of number of homeless households prevented from homelessness, which is the other side of that same coin, essentially, which indicates think as a target how effective we are being in, in preventing people from going into temporary accommodation in the first place. It's sort of complementary complementary um, data points really. Um, I did want to introduce a, a concept I've been trying to get into this um, data set for some time which I've developed through the finance team which speaks to this is about the average cost of temporary accommodation per unit. So, so a, a measure of actually how much it's costing us uh, on average, to, to, to accommodate people on, on a unit cost. So that is something we would provide temporary accommodation assessment um, with respect to with our temporary, temporary accommodation sort of like support service that we've developed, that, that we drive that cost down, and we can control that to a degree. So that would be a helpful target for, for, for members to consider. Also, the average length of stay target is, is, is also difficult in that it's um, is not the best at measuring what it purports to measure. So, if, if for example, we've had 10 people turn up in temporary accommodation this week, which is not good, if our average length of stay on the average has come down, and it sort of looks like we're, we're hope we're doing well. And I do understand that the reason for members wanting to keep an eye on that indicator, which again, in terms of average length of stay by the control officer, again suggests that a target for the team should be around the homelessness and around the average unit 
cost alongside that, alongside that overall number of uh, applications within the same system. So there's quite a lot there, but it has it has been something that I've been thinking about for some time in some years now, to try and get it get it to get the balance right in terms of of um, indicating to the world that we're actually making how effective we're being. So would that be your preference? That's my recommendation. That's your yeah, that, that would be and and would the committee be happy with, with that? Give that a try and that actually see the figures on the ground if you like. Councillor Duff. Yes, I actually agree with, with Joe because um, a strong indicator on the cost of potential accommodation would be very helpful because um, we also got to look at a baseline, what it was costing two or three years ago, to put families into low-grade hotels, which could have been £2,000 a month. So, And also, um, we're still driving on with our securing and buying properties for, for mid-term accommodation, and the more we, we do with that, that will also help with the indication of strong cost of um, temporary accommodation. Um, I know some people think we're not doing very well on that, but we have purchased quite a few properties, and a couple stalled because the people last minute decided they didn't want to sell, which is, that can happen in any person's for a home. Um, but we still have the income and the finance to drive that temporary accommodation uh, purchase and fund, and uh, I'm sure Joe will be strongly uh, doing that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lynn. I think it was made clear by now that the cost of temporary accommodation is huge for us to go out and give it to other people, so to speak. So the drive was to get more houses, buy more houses ourselves. But that, as Councillor Clark says, has stalled. But why? Well, well, uh, if, if, I, if I read, I refer you to the latest report I've read, is that you are in the market for buying more houses, but they've slowed up for some reason. You, you, you had, I think, you had already three, didn't you? How many have you got now? Thank you, Chair. Um, the current number is um, nine, that have been offered to companies, but we, we, we expect to be completing, we've got a big, a, big off, a big building to complete on for March, which is in, we hope with all our completions run Time that we'll be on 20, 20 units by the end of the year, which is in line with the, with the corporate target. But the, you know, obviously, the disruption to the market through COVID and, and, mm -hmm. and the, the spike in, in, in house prices in the last year, and certainly increased nationally, um, has also affected us slightly. But we, 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 we soldier on regardless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. some and some. Yeah. Yeah. That answer your question, Councilman? <laughs> right, so so on let's let's get get to this. Housing and communities. We don't need to know how many houses are going to be built because it's covered everywhere else and, and we don't really need to say how it is. But I think I think Joe's point of, of the cost would be useful. Do you agree? Um, so I think that's sensible. Councillor Portel, is it, is it relevant? Uh, the number prevented from homelessness was the other criterion which Joe mentioned, which I think would be extremely useful. Right. You can do that, Joe? Uh, yeah, yeah. That'll be good. It did used to be on, but it got, ta it got taken off, I think, right. some years ago. But yeah, it used okay. to be on. Right. All right. Councillor Coleman? Uh, yeah, Chair. I just. Um, I've been ruminating on Councillor Barnes's uh, idea about taking away uh, number four, and I just, I, I, I just question whether we we do have policies such as like the DASA, for example, as well as uh, the recent move to, to set up a housing company, which are all intended, I think, to um, try and get housing develop, developments moving and to try and get housing built and to try and encourage the the, the market to, to to build houses. So to that extent, do we not need to measure how successful we are? Doing that, I mean, obviously, we don't have total control over that, but there are some elements where we can teeter around the edges. 
not suggesting we don't collect the information. These are uh, the targets we highlight as our priorities. Uh, the problem with planning is you can give planning, uh, but the house builder doesn't necessarily build out. What we've got at the moment, if you look at our report that we make to the department uh, every year now, because uh, we're supposed not to have sufficient land supply, what's happening is the commission's given line is rising at a faster rate than the build-out line. So the gap is actually widening. If all those houses were built out, we would be proved to have a more than adequate land supply. I mean, unless there's any, unless there's any additional sort of um, uh, recommendations, what I've sort of captured from today is that we would like to keep the recycling percentage as a, as a target. Um, obviously, hoping that that will increase as and in, as in when government changes the uh, the regulations around that. In terms of housing targets, we're going to keep the the uh, the average number of households in in temporary accommodation, um, the number of households on the register. Lose numbers two and four, which would be the length, the, the average length of stay, and the uh, overall number of homes built, but keep affordable housing numbers and adding in number of prevented homelessness. I've changed one of them, the areas a little bit for financial performance because it seems to be a more overall financial performance thing, and then put in there cost of temporary accommodation, uh, which is a, a sort of more of a financial thing rather than necessarily a a service delivery aspect along with the property investment strategy targets as Councillor Barnes asked for and the existing asset income, overarching asset income, because we do, we do, you know, try to sweat our existing assets as much as possible. And then keeping the planning targets as, as they are. Uh, I am going to change it so it's referred to in weeks, so it sort of <laughs> meets with the more, the more common description rather than that. The only question I have, uh, I have in, if I may, Chair, is, is whether or not we want to keep anything under number six, seven, and eight, which relates to the economic development of poverty. Um, the, uh, this was primarily brought in, I remember, as, a, as an op opportunity to sort of a, a dip, dipstick test to see whether or not the, the members of the public are going to suffer as a result of the COVID crisis in terms of whether or not they're going to be able to keep paying their council tax, whether or not the, uh, the, um, the number of the... Uh, 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 council tax reduction claimants would go up as a result of job loss, and etc. But um, whether or not now that those numbers have sort of stabilised and haven't haven't dipped and been volatile in the way that we thought they might, um, whether or not members would like to see that remain as a target into next year. Could I suggest, Chairman, we at least retain seven? That seems to me something we really do need to know, and is something that is under our control. Councillor Coleman, you're the chairman of the Council of Development, I believe. Yeah, I, I, my personal thoughts are it would be useful to, to keep all of these um, in as fact as there, there was levels of poverty prior to the pandemic with austerity and, and if we are possibly facing another austere period, whatever form that might take, I think it's useful to keep following that, um, and especially with our anti-poverty strategy coming forward, it will be useful to see whether that policy is effective, whether that's making a difference. And my only queries would be, is, is this, again, this thing of indicators versus targets. When, when you're looking, for, for example, at uh, the number of claimants of council tax reduction, and you're saying lower is better, well, lower can mean two things. It can mean less people are entitled to council tax reduction because their income is improved. Fantastic. But it can also mean that less people are finding the service and actually they are entitled to it, in which case that's not a better performance, that's worse performance. So, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know if Joe has any thoughts on this. I'm sure he has plenty, and I'd love to hear them. <laughs> do you have any thoughts on that? I, I do. I, I, think, I think it's difficult. Again, it's challenging for us. It's, poverty is not something over which particularly at our level of government we have a great deal of control, and, and therefore it can be quite demotivating in some ways for officers if we give them targets which are in no way achievable. But I think indicators, um, again, it might be worth thinking about whether as an indicator it is, it is useful for us all to understand and track um, uh, the impact of various policies across health, social care, um, 
welfare benefits, you know, job creation, inflation, because there's such a range of drivers of poverty that I, I don't know. It, it comes back to the purpose of the purpose of the um, enterprise that we're reporting on. But sorry, it's not particularly helpful. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think a useful way of looking at this is to think about it as a data-only indicator rather than a target-driven indicator. I think it makes sense for quite a few of these to be reported in that way. Um, it doesn't really make sense if you, know, you could misinterpret why we're setting a target for something like that. Um, and you're quite right. Is lower better good? You know, bad? Uh, it's quite difficult to understand for an uh, indicator like this. So I think what I might recommend on some of these is that we actually look at them as data only and not set a target. Well, sort of, sort of. Well, it was, it was, I, was, I was sort of, I'll be honest with you, I was sort of on the side a little bit with Councillor Barnes on this one, it, but for the same reasons in that actually it's, it's, it's A, it's, it can be a little bit of a misleading target as Councillor Coleman pointed out, but also it's not something over which we have a significant amount of control because people's situation, people's you know, personal lives either you know, entitle them or not to the council tax reduction scheme. So unless we are either making changes to that scheme which we would then might want to monitor the difference. It's, it's sort of a state of the district type thing, and it's, it's whether or not we want these to be performance targets for um, sort of state of the district indicators. I would say that you know there are numerous. We, we, we do monitor these things, and there are numerous other channels under which we we keep these. Um, we, we do report these sorts of targets. So it's just whether or not this committee feel that it's something that they can scrutinise on a quarterly basis um, and add value to. Um, I completely agree things like the council tax collection rates. If that suddenly plummets, then something's going horribly wrong. I'm trying not to look at Chris at the moment. But, um, but you know, it's something that's operational. It's something that's within our control. Um, the, uh, the, the, the number of council tax reduction claimants, is, whilst information that's really important to know about our community, whether or not it's an indicator of council performance, I think, is, 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 is part of that discussion. And I think that's sort of why we... You know, sort of took a step back from trying to make recommendations on what should and shouldn't be uh, considered for this one this time round. Yes, go on, John. Yeah, it's, it's a complex issue with many strands, and um, the problem is that there's there's some wards in in, in Robert of high levels of deprivation, and we know which ones they are, but there are other wards where that is not so much of a problem. Um, one of the things that we should be looking at is um, since the monitorium has been lifted on eviction of tenants, has there been a spike on the number of evictions and which causes more homeless allocation for robbers? So I think we should be look, watching that because I think it was October it was lifted last year. So is that going to be a factor that's going to drive, drive as well? And do we need to we'll be aware of that? I was going to say, this is something that I, I suppose you know, would be picked up in, in terms of um, both the work that Joe does on a day-to-day -day basis with his team, but also in the annual uh, report that we do on the housing and homelessness strategy. You know, obviously that, that, that report comes back to this committee on an annual basis for an update. Whether or not you'd want anything more frequent than that, or just sort of leave it in the hands of the, of the head of service to sort of bring that and raise that as and when it becomes a bit of an issue. I think if, it, I think if it's significantly increased, then obviously you would be making members aware across the council, not just to, through scrutiny. And I think it's worth mentioning that, that all these indicators are, are all there somewhere in the council. If this is just the ones that we we request that come here every quarter or so mm -hmm. for us to look at. And, and also, um, you know, should we be should we be looking at the environmental, you know, the climate change or the carbon reduction or whatever else. Is that something? It's definitely some it's definitely something that's been referred back to a number of times. I think it's I think if even if it's not added now as a recommendation, I think it will come through from Cabinet when when these go up to Cabinet to be considered. Um, I think it's an important indicator, it's one of the key overarching strategies. It may not be updated quarterly, so you may not be seeing regular things, but when we do uh, make improvements, we'll be able to update it to the carbon uh, footprint benchmark, and I think 
having those having it included in those quarterly checks will be uh, will be important. Yes, yeah, so I'm just thinking: should we should we as a committee include that as opposed to old school? What have I got? Should we be one step ahead? I would. <laughs> I think that might be a good idea. Should we be one step ahead? And, and Councillor Gray be extremely happy. <laughs> um, so have you got me that? So Ben's got it all written down. You want me to go through it? Yeah, go, yeah, go, go through it quickly and then we'll come on to the rest. Okay, so one last thing. We, we've sort of still got five themes, if you like. One more around the environment now, which includes the recycling percentage and also the carbon baseline. Housing targets is to keep the number of households in TA, the number of households on the register, uh, number of affordable homes delivered, and the number of homeless, uh, the amount of the number of prevented homelessness. Um, financial performance is asset, um, the overall asset income, specifically the property investment income, and then the cost of temporary accommodation. Um, planning, we're going to keep the targets as is, but the first one in weeks, which is the, uh, the more common vernacular. And then um, keep the council tax collection rates as is. I haven't had a clear steer on whether or not we keep the council tax reduction ones. Um, so maybe just that last last one to bottom out if I may chair. I think we should keep that one in. Um, I think we have got policies going through the council that affect the council tax reduction rate. We've got the, I think there was a recent uh, move to include um, self-employed uh, residents and to see how that affects it. Um, and there was also a, a statement about uh, when in the future to, to look at council tax reduction again. So I think we should be monitoring it consistently for that reason. Back to you, Dutton. Um, Councillor Cortell, if you're quick. Uh, thank you, Chair. I agree with Councillor Coleman that it should be in. Um, I very much like the approach of our new Deputy Chief Executive um, in, in suggesting it should be there as an indicator rather than as a target. And if we could have a separate category where we are informed in terms of, an of uh, seeing the, the information indicatively rather than setting a target for the future. Uh, Councillor Barber. I, I agree with uh, what the Deputy Chief Executive and Councillor Cortella said. I think it might be useful. It's a question really of what we have quarterly and what we have at other stages. I think at some stage it might be useful to update us on a number of indicators that are not targets, which give us a picture of the risk, which um, air quality is one that I would be quite interested in. Um, and there may be one or two environmental health ones, which I wouldn't want to see quarterly, uh, but I think will be useful indicators uh, to see what the state of the district is. Good. Um, someone want to... Need a mover and second on this, Louise? Yep. Someone want to move that? Councillor Cook and a seconder. Councillor Gray, I'll put that as a seconder. All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you very much. Um, you're off, Joe. Thank you. And Richard, thank you very much. Um, item six, recommendations of the off street. Car parks, Carson Finch Group, page 7 to 18. The purpose of the report is to summarise the work of the Off Street Car Parks, Carson Finch Group, and the outline of the group's final recommendation to have reform. Councillor Cook. I speak later because I need to repair my internet. Good idea. Yep. 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 Got that. Um, who wants to kick, kick this one? Deborah? Thank you, Chair. Yes, as you say, this report summarises the work completed by the Off Street Car Parks Task and Finch Group since its inception in October 2022. Um, the Car Parks Task and Finch Group was asked to consider car park charges, car park hours of operation, use of car park permits, whilst taking into account the need to generate sufficient income 
to um, maintain all aspects of the car park provision and operation. Discussions were supported at each meeting with monthly data on income and levels of car park usage. And the group was also to provide recommendations to inform the 12-month annual review of the parking enforcement led by East Sussex County Council, who in, in their own turn report um, in early 2022, February, March time. So following a call for evidence in the first six months um, from a variety of car park users, the overwhelming response from the parishes, town councils, businesses, community groups and sports clubs um, was that they could not provide accurate and appropriate feedback um, due to COVID-19 restrictions and lockdowns preventing people going about their normal routines and businesses. So the feedback requested an extension to the review and this was supported by the views of the task and finish group and an extension was agreed until October 2021. But during those first six months, various changes were identified and following cabinet approval in May 2021, various changes were made. Um, for instance, Dame Mike Road, um, Gibbets Marsh and Lower Market and Battle were designated as long-stay car parks. Um, chargeable hours were brought in line across the district. Um, signage um, permitting um, for permit parking was improved and made clearer. The cash and payment machine um, was to be installed at Manor Gardens car park. Um, in the second six months of the group's work, a second call for evidence was completed with the same organisations and car park users and further monthly data was submitted for review. And paragraph 16 and 17 of the report summarises the results respectively. Um, evidence over the whole 12 months shows that car park usage in general is now returning to normal pre-COVID pandemic levels. Um, it also shows that the number of people choosing to use a mobile phone app, Ringo in this case, as a payment option continues to steadily increase year on year. Um, after some delays due to supply and delivery issues, a card pay, a cash payment machine was installed in Manor Gardens in November 21, which has improved accessibility for many customers. Um, various further changes um, have been considered as out, outlined in paragraphs 24 to 27, and approval is sought as part of this report for their implementation. With regards to the civil parking enforcement scheme, um, the East Sussex County Council first annual review of on-street parking enforcement was open for feedback from all members of the public until the end of September 2021. And the task and finish group actively encouraged as many people as possible to submit their views via the East Sussex website. As can be seen in paragraph 30 of the report, this proved enormously successful with just under a thousand responses received by East Sussex. Their normal level of response is about 300. <laughs> um, collating information received from people's responses to the two calls for evidence, monthly car park data and officers' feedback from the parking team, the task and finish group has drafted a formal response to be submitted to East Sussex County Council to inform their first 12-month review, and which is based on the points noted in paragraph 33 and can be seen in Appendix A of this report. The group would like the opportunity in the future to assess the changes that East Sussex County Council introduced as a result of the feedback. Finally, the group decided that as the payment machine has only recently been installed in Manor Gardens car park, um, they would also like to complete further assessments of the use of that car park in the, in the near future. So Appendix B um, sets out amended terms of reference to facilitate both those points and suggesting that the group reconvene in October 2022. Um, so um, those are the formal recommendations as listed um, one to four on the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Deborah. Councillor Cook, you very ably chaired the... Uh, Task and finish group. Uh, 
sure you are not to say about it, and you'll be very happy to remove your recommendation. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'd like to start by actually paying tribute to, to Deborah and her team, and in particular, Lindsay Goodwill, um, for all the hard work that they put in um, to this particular task and finish group, and also to my fellow councillors who supported me. Um, most of it was done virtually, um, and a lot of it was quite lengthy and quite time-consuming. But I believe that actually we achieved what we set out to do. Um, the terms of reference that were given to us, I believe that we took on board and we have ended up with what I consider to be an extremely good um, report. Um, I support the um, call for us to reconvene in six months' time to consider the use of the payment machine at Manor Gardens Car Park um, and also perhaps to review um, our decision to suspend charges at the Pole Grove, which um, has already caused issues. But other than that, um, I would absolutely commend this report to this committee. Thank you. Um, Councillor Field. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to this item. Um, yes, I would like to thank also this group um, for doing an amazing job tackling um, the parking issue from this authority. Um, having been part of a previous incarnation of this in the previous session of the Council, I know how extraordinarily difficult and fraught and emotional it can be. So lovely to receive such a calm and measured report. A um, couple of things about the recommendation or the report to Kent Council. Um, not surprised to see the comment about time limited phase because in Blackwood we were told um, it's very inefficient, it's very difficult to enforce time limited phase because it needs two visits from an enforcement officer um, as opposed to the one you need if a ticket's expired. So the fewer of those the better because of course it will free up time for those officers to spend more time in the places where we actually want them. I'm interested in the comment about Ticehurst and Hurst Green because I thought, well I know the whole district is included in the parking um, enforcement and I just thought that those villages had lines anyway so I'm surprised to that but that's on street off street. My main comments relate to the recommendations and yes I'm certainly glad to know this isn't the end of it, that it will be reconvening in six months' time to do some more work. Recommendation two, and this is a really nitpicky issue, but the public read this. It says, car parking charges be suspended in the Pole Grove, Bexhill and Dry Salt. The way the comma is placed says to me, at the Pole Grove, comma, and Bexhill and Rye Salt, not at the Pole Grove, Bexhill and Rye Salt. Um, it's, I know what it means. I had to read it twice. I think, I think it might cause difficulties, perhaps, in the public. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say was I'm really glad that the recommendations on changes to the car park changes remain and that there's going to be an annual review um, with the fees and charges section of the budget because um, car parking fees are a fee in charge. They need to be part of the budget process. They're not separate to the rest of the business of the council. So... Yes, my, my final remark is um, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I know how difficult it is. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Uh, Councillor Maiden. Uh, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> I'd like to make one observation, if I may, um, and nobody will be surprised to know that it's regarding Manor Gardens car park and the replacement cash machine. Um, I would like to see it better signposted because I'm getting comments that nobody knows it's actually there because they've tucked it away understandably because it's near electricity but to the point that it is being missed and people are still quite happily going up to the corner shop if they have no other means of payment. Thank you. Councillor uh, Barnes, Mary Barnes. Yes, thank you Chairman um, and, and thank you Councillor field for pointing out uh, the needs of Hurst Green and Ticehurst. I would just like to draw attention particularly to Ticehurst and Hurst Green because they are in my patch. And I'm aware that when you drive through Hurst Green, the first thing that strikes you is just nose-to-tail illegal parking. That is because there is absolutely nowhere else for, for residents to put their cars. And it is of grave concern to, to the parish council uh, likewise, in Ticehurst, which is also a huge problem, 
So I would ask that before any kind of formal scheme is put in place, please make sure that you keep liaising with parish councils because they are the ones who know the facts. When cottages which were built um, hundreds of years ago uh, were not expecting to have to cope with cars um, and, 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 and motor vehicles, um, it has become of late a particularly big problem. Yes, it is a big problem with um, commuters, but the main problem is actually where the residents put their own cars, and there simply is not the room to put them. So I think this is one that ne needs to be dealt with fairly comprehensively, but also very sensitively. Um, and I'd be grateful, you know, if you could take that on board. I, I think I will say that, it, you know, that the on-street parking is an hour. It, it's the county council who deal with it, but obviously it's in our letter, and, and Deborah can ensure has been released to us as a county council to ensure that parish councils are involved in any discussions to extend the scheme, I would assume. Um, Councillor Kirby Green. Thank you. Um, could I just come back to Councillor Barnes? It doesn't sound like we're very uh, coordinated. I apologise, but I actually, being the East Sussex representative for Ticehurst, I actually suggested Ticehurst Parish Council spoke to Deborah about it. So it's not the fact that Rother are going to suddenly implement this without Ticehurst have actually instigated the conversation to bring it in as part of the reformatting of their village square in Ticehurst. They want to put yellow lines at the corner, which will stop people parking at the corner of Church Street. So please be reassured. I don't think Rother have any intentions of, or East Sussex, of implementing CP in Ticehurst without discussions with the Parish Council. Um, the only other comment I wanted to make was that, Councillor Field, you mentioned about a good thing about removing the time-limited phase. I get why it obviously is cost-effective. It, it's not cost-effective because you've got to have someone coming back. But to, to move them to resident permit phase, doesn't that destroy the point of time limit? It's, it's, a, it's the churn of traffic. So Battle High Street, for instance, it's freeing up spaces every 20 minutes or every half hour. If you make it residence permit phase, doesn't that just defeat the whole object and you'll have residents park in their car all day? That's just what I thought when I read that. I, I, would, I would assume... I would assume that these are specific streets, probably outside of the town centre. Would that be would that be correct, Deborah? Not necessarily, but it may not be just residence permit phase. They could be two hours on residence permit phase. So you, during the day, you get that two hour churn, um, and then it, they become residents at night. But um, but again, you're limited to that two hour return. Um, this was more to do with, I believe, balancing out the four hours and the two hours. Some were one and some were others. There was a bit of a variation in it. And um, when I spoke to East Sussex County Council, the team that are involved in this, they also said that it, it, it is very costly. The time consuming to do time limited phase. But, um, you know, there's a variety of those and they work in different streets. I would assume that they're, they're probably in a similar position that they're learning the streets, if you like, aren't they? So, so, so their their chaps are knowing where, where, you know, where's easy to patrol and where's not so easy to patrol, and they're just reporting back. So, you know, they're, they're going to the, the scheme needs adjusting to suit everybody's living to a degree. So, Councillor Arrington. Thank you, and once again, thank you to um, Councillor Cook and her team, and to Deborah. It's a really emotive subject to commit parking, and I think that people have been listened to, which is great. Just a couple of questions, and I'm really sorry that I didn't get to you earlier. Twelve month free period at the Cold Grove and at the Salts. That's already started. When when does the twelve months finish? Uh, we're not agreeing it from tonight. That's what I'm saying. It's it's, it's already in place, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Um, the other thing was asking East Sussex to consider seasonal enforcement. Do you think they've got the appetite for doing, presumably that is extra checks down at Camber, down at Her Brown Walk, which obviously is going to be more income, but with it comes um, a fair amount of hassle. I think I think Deborah. I think it would be fair to say that the, the I think is it is it Daryl, 
Dan, Dan from East Sussex, he he came on to a, a Radcott meeting, which was seasonal, and, and I was very impressed with him. To be honest, I was very impressed with him, and, and he's got he's got ideas up his sleeve for uh, employing people local into council uh, into Camber who actually live there, so that you know when there's a busy day, you can make the phone call, off you go. And and that's and, and, and he's got it, he's got it sorted out. He was pretty pretty damn impressive with him to be honest with you. Really good. Um, and I assume that's what he was doing with her brand talk as well and everything else. So so I'm 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 not easy with, with the name. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Dan Dan Clark, East Sussex, he's he's been he's really good throughout the whole scheme implementation, very very supportive and very responsive to, to the items raised and uh, he certainly has. He has a lot of people down at, at Canberra, in particular, who are very keen to um, improve enforcement down there for parking and a potentially a ready and willing workforce <laughs> to um, to be trained up and, and and do some of it. So um, obviously, it has to be done with, with careful thought and, and diligence. But um, yes, he he is very open to seasonal and events and things like that. If we've got any events coming up that we feel. You know, we would want people to work longer hours uh, and do more enforcement in different areas of the town, and they can they can support that as well with good notice. Yeah, yeah I think this is a really good piece of work from the parking group and uh, from Deborah. I, I, I keep my ear to the to the ground in terms of social media, uh, quite infamously, and um, certainly in Bexhill, the the, the the chatter has been. Relatively harmonious, considering it's it's such a divisive issue. Um, I, I tend to judge parking conversations much like the BBC judges their complaints, which is if one side gets significantly louder than the other, you know there's an issue there. And I think more or less those who are in favour are still happy, and, and those who are just generally not one way or the other seem to be relatively happy with it. And certainly the residents seem to have had improved, um, you know, and those who are around seem to be feeling the improvements from it. Um, but I, uh, the one issue that does come up is Manor Gardens, and so I'm really pleased to see that there's this review taking place, and hopefully that will make the issues clear so that the group can find a solution with Deborah. It may be a creative solution, because certainly from social media, it seems some of the issues have been with people who work in and around the, the car park, you know, struggling to pay those fees, and maybe some sort of like workers' pass or something could be implemented if that was viable. So all of these ideas, I think, can be looked at when they have that, that evidence base there. So on that basis, presuming Councillor Cook's proposing it, I would be more than happy to second this report. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I should press my button. That's carried. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, item 7. Chief Finance Officer, oh. to receive a draft revenue budget referred from Cabinet to its meeting held on the 10th of January 2022 to report recommendations arising from reproduced below and the minutes of that meeting. Officer recommendation resolved that the comments of this committee be considered by Cabinet when setting the 2022-23 draft revenue budget for this meeting on 7th of February. Hey, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so uh, as uh, Councillor Osmond just said, this uh, report was um, report, uh, taken to Cabinet on the 10th of January. It was effectively the uh, second phase of the budget process, with the first phase being back in uh, November, December time, when we uh, took a high-level uh, report for the uh, medium-term financial plan. So uh, this report's got a little bit more detail in for members to, uh, to um, consider. Uh, once overview is, uh, is considered, it will then we'll take a final budget report to Cabinet on the 7th of February. Uh, and then that report then underpins the council tax meeting, if you like, a full council on the 21st of February. So the main headlines, uh, in, in many respects, whilst there's been quite a lot of changes between um, phases one and two, uh, the actual bottom line hasn't changed an awful lot. Uh, and it's broadly the same. The funding gap for 22-23 is still forecast to be about 3.3 million. And uh, we hope to be in a surplus position by 2025-26. Um, as I said a few seconds ago, 
Appendix B gives a break, uh, greater level of detail for members if they wish to see it. It breaks it down at a service level. Uh, and Appendix C um, gives a high level uh, comparison of year on year budget. So uh, that will be comparing 21 22, 22 23. And again, as, as ever, Appendix D shows the impact on, uh, on the council's reserves. Uh, and as I say, it's, it's changed very, very marginally since the, uh, the first phase uh, of the report. Um, what I have put in this report is uh, we, we received the local government finance settlement on the 16th of December. Now, if you remember back in uh, back in the uh, end of October, the, uh, the Chancellor's autumn budget statement, there was lots of numbers thrown around, increase this by X percent and that by X percent and so forth, uh, which is all very interesting. But on a sort of individual level, but council by council level, is a little bit meaningless unless you try to sort of try, uh, dissect it a little bit. So... I just sort of put a little bit in there for members, paragraphs five to nine. It really is just for information and nothing else, uh, just to try and explain some of the terminology that, um, that members may have, uh, have been you know, heard banded around. Uh, the main one being the core spending power. And now our grant allocations, and I'll come to grant allocations in a little bit, uh, they are, broadly speaking, they are based uh, or partially based around what our core spending power is. And now our core spending power is the is central government's assessment of what they think the council needs to spend. So it's not necessarily what we, as a council, think we need to spend. They are uh, they are subtly different. Um, but there's some some there's some positivity in the sta in, in the um, in the settlement for for rather council. As I say, I will talk about that in, in greater detail in, in, a, in a bit. Uh, it is only a one year settlement, which is a real drawback, I feel, because it really does make um, for, uh, forward financial planning rather difficult to do. So it's a settlement for 22, 23 uh, only, I'm afraid. Uh, but just to go over the main changes since we've last uh, we've last met, uh, we had a quarter of a million pounds extra put in the budget this year for homelessness, and that's been uh, carried on into 2022, 23, uh, because we see that um, current demand is matching what we, uh, what we uh, uh, budgeted for. So we felt it was sensible to keep that in there. Uh, I did say in the previous report that we'd be looking at inflation and reviewing what our assumptions have been around inflation. There's been a lot of increases in that. We've got the national insurance inflation, uh, sorry, the national uh, insurance increase rather to um, kick in from April 2022. Uh, there's rising energy costs, as I'm sure everybody has, uh, has heard now. And uh, we've had to increase our uh, refuse contract budget as well by, I think, it was around about 5%. Uh, because that's the, the formula that was um, uh, sort of burnt into the contract, if you like. So that's added a, about half a million pounds to the overall uh, cost of the, uh, uh, the council. What I've also done this year, on a, uh, and hopefully members will support this, is uh, we've created a budget contingency of £200,000. That's not something we've done before, but this is to sort of legislate, in inverted commas, against unforeseeable events and maybe future inflation increases. Uh, I think I explained to Cabinet that um, even some of the finest economists in the land have struggled to forecast the economy over the next uh, two or three months. So uh, I don't think I'm going to do any better than they are in that respect. So it's to give us a little bit of a, of a cushion, which we've been able to do because of the, uh, the, the settlement. So in paragraphs 22, 25, I'll say a little bit more about our grant income there. Um, new homes bonus, we're getting £467,000 next year, and that's a real, uh, that was an unexpected bonus. Uh, we weren't, uh, we didn't budget to get that. Um, service gr services grant, we have a one-off grant of £164,000. That wasn't foreseen either. That was, uh, not, we were not able to pick that. Local tier services grant, £107,000. That's continued from uh, the current financial year, but again, we weren't, um, we weren't informed that that was going to be carried over into 22-23, so that was quite welcome as well. Uh, a tiny increase in our uh, rural service delivery grant of about £32,000. And the local council tax support schemes, business administration grant and uh, homelessness prevention grants, they're all broadly in line with the forecast that we have so far. So if I can just go back quickly um, to the new homes bonus grant and the, the services grant, the Government have, or the DLUHC have repeated that there will be a, a fair funding review, or a funding review as they're now calling it. So we've still got that to, uh, to look forward to or to anticipate. 
Um, the services grant that I previously mentioned, £164,000, that is definitely not going to form part of that funding review. So I think we, you know, we've got that one off some money for next year, and it will only be for, for next year. Uh, new homes bonus is going to feature as part of that funding review. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the £467,000 will continue beyond 2022-23. We don't know what it's going to look like at this stage. We've got no information of what that may, what, what form that may take or what uh, what the, um, the successor to the new, uh, uh, new homes bonus grant may look like. So I've not put anything in the future years forecast, and I think that is the sensible thing to do at this stage. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's broadly on the grants, Chair. Um, there's a little bit more tinkering to do in the budget around the collection fund surplus figure, but it's, uh, but it's not going to materially change the, it's not going to change the numbers by much between now and what we report to um, to Cabinet on the 7th of February. Uh, it's quite a tricky number to predict um, because we, we when we set the, um, uh, the council tax for next year and when we uh, when we set our business rates for next year, that's what we draw down. That will be money guaranteed. But if the collection rates then prove that we collect more or less, that adjustment gets taken through in the following financial year, if that makes sense. So it's, that's the bit that we've been trying to work through. Uh, and it is quite a tricky exercise to do this time around because we're trying to work through what happened in 2021 20, with the pandemic and, and, uh, and lockdown and so forth. Uh, but we did make quite sizable provisions for bad debt and so forth in that financial year. So it's not going to have a, a, a massive impact. I, I hope that's uh, clear to members. It's quite a tricky thing to, to explain, I'm afraid. Um, but overall, it was a good uh, settlement in many respects. Uh, and as I say, we've got additional um, chunks of money coming to the council that we weren't originally anticipating. That's given us the ability to absorb some of those higher inflationary increases that we weren't expecting. Uh, and also giving us the ability to set a, a contingency budget as well, which is a, 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 you know, a more comforting position to be in a sense. Um, but, as I say, the underlying negative message, I'm afraid, is that it is a one-year settlement, and that still causes us problems. Uh, and unfortunately, that really means that the financial challenges that the council face don't go away, I'm afraid, Chair. Um, an awful lot of detail behind that, and I'm happy to try and field any questions. Thank you very much, Cody. Um any questions? Just call Councillor Barnes in. Yeah. Councillor Errington first, then. And then, then Councillor Barnes. Um, <laughs> and my, my apologies for not asking this this afternoon. And maybe Colin can get back to us. On the variations, halfway down it says additional resources to process planning applications backlog, 63,000. Sorry, this is on page 28, the variances. If I may, yeah. That's a, a continuation of, uh, not in total, but it's a continuation of the um, money that, if you remember what we were talking about earlier, the additional investment that we put into processing planning applications, so it's a continuation of that. So is this to capita, and is it on top of the 270? It's to capita. I'd have to check whether it's on top of the 270. I don't think it is on top of the 270, because that wasn't built into the base, so I think it's just... Uh, Releasing that. Yeah, extra it, within that 270. It's, I'm sure it's on my fault. It's, the 270 is a cost in this planning financial year. Yeah. Uh, I can't read it, so I'll have to give you a couple of answers on that when I find it. But it's um, <coughs> uh, the additional cost that we have in the appendix is a one off for 22-23 only. So it's not in addition to the 270 that we were, that we were anticipating spending in 21-22. Does that, that make sense? Yeah. I got there eventually. I get it. So, so we budgeted to have capita in for basically the same twelve months. Then we move into an extra six months for the rest of the year. Is that basically? Yes. <laughs> Councillor Maynard, you was sort of looking quizzical. In regard of, obviously, we have an agency temporary head of um, development control. Is his additional income over and above what we'd normally pay um, a, a head of development control also as part of that that 270? Or is that, is that over and above that 270? Sorry, Councillor Mayor, could you repeat the question? I didn't catch yeah. the first one. So we've got, a, we've got an agency head of development control. 
that he's paid more than the previous head of developed control was paid. What I want to know, essentially, is where is that additional cost shown within the budget? Okay, I'll have to get back to you on the detail of that. So, okay. sorry. Sorry, it's only come up because of a point that's already been raised. So, I just wanted to clarify that issue. Was 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 that? Did we mention that earlier? In the earlier part, then that that, that was an existing staff budget that was not spent. So yeah, in terms of this year's budget, it would have been covered by um, the existing posts of the development manager and the initial uh, costs would have been met by, by some of the savings we've made by not having a head of service or planning. Um, so it would have meant a reduction in the amount of salary savings we would have made through that redundancy. Uh, in terms of next year's budget, I'm not sure we've included it as yet because we've not anticipated at this stage that um, we're going to have uh, that into an insert for more than maybe a couple of months whilst we wait for the completion of the project, um, which we aim to do. So it, we haven't sort of put a figure on that yet, but we're not anticipating it being any more than two or three months into favour. Okay. Councillor Barnes. Yes, Chairman. Obviously, there, is a, there are a lot of detailed questions one could ask. I want to just take us up, I think, to the bigger picture. Um, it, it struck me we're running down our reserves at an extraordinary rapid rate now. Um, and I look back to the start of the term, and I compared the rate at which we thought we were going to run down reserves to the rate at which we're running down reserves. And I've looked also at the running costs, the net running cost of the council, uh, which is now substantially higher than that we thought it was going to be, and indeed uh, substantially higher than what we were actually spending on the similar pattern of services um, in that budget year. Um, it's a worrying one because if we keep like this, um, we are actually going to go below the five million we set as the minimum level below which you should not dip. Indeed, we'll, Tony will give you the figure, I've no doubt, uh, for this year. Uh, but we're already down substantially on where we thought we would be uh, back at the start of this term of office. Um, now, what's gone wrong? Well, the major thing that's gone wrong, and I think this must be one of our recommendations to Cabinet, is we really do need to get back into the acquisition of properties and the generation of income. Because the big hole here, uh, I think the figure now is we're raising about nine, 950,000 in income from our properties, something of that order. It may be slightly higher. Um, we were looking to have 2.5 million. So we're about one and a half million short on what was to be the strategy uh, to close the reserve gap. Um, so that must be our number one recommendation, is to do something about that. Homelessness is another hole. Um, I know it's not the only reason why we're making contingency, but we tend to overshoot on homelessness payments. It's usually an overspend on the budget uh, as we monitor it. And what we allowed, and again, I pay credit to uh, Charlie here, I think, uh, we did actually start to buy properties um, to deal with the bed and breakfast problem uh, that we incurred. Uh, but we've only spent about half the sum um, that we actually put in the budget. So, again, we could make faster progress on that, and at least that would eat into one of the leaks in the budget. And... Uh, begin not only, I think, to benefit the people who are actually trying to help, uh, but simply in strict financial terms, it would actually be an enormous benefit. So I think those two ought to be uh, top of our recommendations. Um, I, I don't know how much longer we can go on without a serious uh, savings program. Um, there are going to be some obvious savings. Uh, you may be able to transfer 
some services to battle, uh, not battle, Bexhill Town Council. But of course, at that stage, you forfeit the special expenses. Um, you clearly, at some stage, are going to stop paying capita because we'll have cleared the backlog. That's another obvious uh, saving. And there are one or two other things like that uh, which will almost fall out of the woodwork. But they're not going to bridge the gap between we were projecting to run at a net cost of services of about, uh, well, it was under 40 million, it was just over 13 million. We're currently budgeting a net cost of services over 16 million. Uh, so with all those savings and property, we might just about balance. I'm still not sure where we're going to start increasing our reserves again. The last time we increased our reserves uh, was really now in the previous term when we actually did increase our reserves quite substantially. If we hadn't, we really would be in trouble now. Um, I don't know. I've, I've shared some of this with Tony to check I was being financially accurate. But two recommendations, really two cabinets. One is if you don't drive the property uh, strategy ahead, uh, we're going to be in dead uh, problems. And secondly, can we please speed up this dealing with the bed and breakfast uh, problem so that we don't have this uh, slightly big leak? It, it tends to be an overspend of about a couple of hundred thousand. And that's an unnecessary overspend if we actually drive that scheme through. And we allocated eight millions. So I think we spent about four. Um, so it seems to me those are two very obvious strategy points which really ought to be picked up and really driven forward in this year's budget. I would think, I, I think to be fair, Councillor Barnes, um, Joe mentioned it in an earlier report that when questioned by, by Charlie that the, uh, and, and Councillor Mooney, that we've got a number of, you know, his number of properties is, is, is coming up, probably doubling on that, couldn't it, to, to 22 odd units, is that right? For, for a complete, uh, complete them soon by the end of the financial year. Obviously they're not, so I don't know how that will affect Tony's budget going forward, forward, forward. <laughs> if you know what I mean, because he hasn't got them yet. But, so I suppose, you know, movement is there. It's just not it, it's, it's, it's the pace and the degree of urgency um, because the financial situation is actually looking for its rip. Um, and you would have expected, I think, uh, I know COVID it, it does pose problems, but on the other hand, the property market has been moving. At the moment, unfortunately, prices are going up against us and have been going up steadily. So, again, we're in a worse position than we were if we could have bought more of these properties uh, last year. Um, I can't see any sign that the housing market is going to crack. If I could, I, I think we would be sensible to hang on, but I think at this moment there is no sign the housing market is going to crack. So the sooner we do it, uh, the more we will be cost-effective what we're doing. I also, I, I hate to mention it because I bang on, but Councillor Maynard and I, in 20, uh, no, 20, 2021, did suggest that we acquired some prefabricated units and put them up on the land that we own to the rear of the town hall. I've also suggested we might actually put it over our car parks, not actually removing any car parking space or very few, uh, but actually we could have housed some of the homeless there. That too would have generated an income uh, for us uh, to offset some of the costs on this building. Um, so these ideas have been kicking around and they are being taken forward, uh, but without the degree of urgency, and I think I want to inject a degree of urgency, uh, because otherwise we are going to be in a very serious 
financial problem. We could well, we're already planning to go down to 4.4 million of reserves. Uh, we could actually be a lot lower, and then we really will be in trouble. I think, I think Tony's question is, 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 is there including costs of capital savings as well? Is, is that right, Tony? Yeah, it does, Chair, but clearly that's obvious. It's obviously those, uh, the being, uh, maintaining our levels of reserves is dependent on achieving those savings, obviously. Um, can I just make a, uh, another observation, but um, picking up on something Councillor Bland said, and I'm, everything you said factually is, is correct, Councillor Bland, but one thing I would say about the homelessness budget is that it's very, um, we're, tr we're controlling the price, and I think Joe did mention this in, uh, a little while ago, that we can influence the price, and I think he can um, pull data out from members that demonstrates that we're actually are influencing the price. What we can't influence is the volume, because that tends to, we have limited influence over the volume, and that, yeah, that's what causes the problem. <coughs> Excuse me, and that's what makes it such a difficult budget to forecast as well. So, it's not for me to. Um, I, I can't say whether the pace of the program could be speeded up or not. That's not my call. But I do think that um, we have got demonstrable information, if you like, that um, proves that the program, uh, in in some some respects, financially has been a success. What we identified on the housing task force was that if we bought, and Charlie implemented this, if we actually bought houses to deal with bed and breakfast, you create a virtual, a virtuous circle, uh, because the money that you are paying out in benefit then goes into your coffers uh, by way of the payment of the building. So you create, instead of a vicious circle, a virtuous circle. And the sooner we can complete that, uh, we'll mend a major leak in the budget, which has been problematic for the very reasons that Tony is saying. Yeah, I think I, I agree with what you say, Councillor, but I think, I think from, from what Tony said, the amount of homelessness has increased. So, so whilst we, you know, we've done what we can to, to keep the price low, the trouble is if we, if we, if we halve our costs, we get twice as many, it still costs us the same as it did 18 months ago. So we haven't really saved, what you're saying saved, increases my feeling of urgency because with an inflation crisis that we're getting, I mean, we haven't seen levels of inflation like this uh, since the 1970s. In fact, probably the late 70s. And uh, that actually was likely to increase homelessness and therefore the burdens on us. Right, there's a number of councillors have indicated, so I'll go with Councillor Clark. Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I remember having a discussion with uh, Robin uh, Bennard not so long ago, because I used to think one of the ways we can stimulate income is all this new build and people are paying us council tax. But unfortunately, we only get a, a percentage of that council tax as of authority. So it doesn't stimulate a huge amount of money. It's some, but it's nowhere near the 300% figure or, or I think more like 20 or 12 percent of it we get for a household. I mean, I don't know, but we're not going to be able to rely on that to dig us out of a hole just on new builds and new build housing if we don't get all the council tax, not the full amount. Thank you, Chair. I think Councillor Barnes is correct to be concerned about a deficit in in reserves and, and the need and plugging plugging that deficit from reserves. And indeed, when this administration took over. We were in a, a deep, dark hole in terms of plugging those reserves. Uh, and I'm really pleased to see that despite the pandemic and the challenges of the last few years, that there is a, a curve that is eventually and carefully, uh, without being reckless, without risking services being lost, is, is going to end up in a surplus. I'm really glad to see that. And I'm, you know, thank you to the officers and our current administration. Unfortunately, whilst this administration has changed, the uh, leadership of government hasn't changed for now, for now. Um, and whilst that's the case, we've got short-term settlements, we've got inflation crises, uh, and a lot of things making things harder and harder for people and harder and harder for councils without recompense, without, without the funding we need to deliver amazing services that we could be delivering with proper funding. And so I think Council Barnes has to consider that context. Thank you, Chair. Okay. 
I think I'll have to say that the, the reserves were actually increased under the previous administration. Anyway, uh, Councillor Mooney, you'll probably know more about it. What do I do? You want to come? Well, just to address uh, the last councillor's statement, you pull through through corona, coronavirus, COVID-19 or whatever, you did with government help. With government help, and you had some left over, actually. Really and truly, I studied the figures a slight little bit, but not a lot. But that's, so that's dealt with that. But... I think John Barnes is right. Where is the one million extra going to come out of over the next four, three years? That's what I want to know. And I have never seen in my time, 24 years as a councillor, so much use of reserves. 3.6 million in each year. It's phenomenal. The most we ever took from reserves in our administration was a million, and then we put back half a million, and then we ended up with a surplus. But I'm not too sure that you're going to, you're going to have that sort of you know, holiday. So I, I want to know, where are you? You know, with regard, I don't see anything in here that's actually telling me that money is, unless it falls from the sky. Perhaps it does. Maybe there is a something that we don't know. But where is it going to come from? <laughs> well, I can rule out the sky if that's any help. <laughs> which, uh, it's not coming out of there. Um, no, look, I mean, we, it is difficult. These are, are difficult times. I want to try and, I'm going to try and avoid using the phrase unprecedented times. But it's, it is a challenging financial, financial position, and we've never ducked to that. We've been very upfront. Officers have been very upfront with members about this, the scale of the challenge. Uh, but we do feel, uh, as Chief Finance Officer, I feel that we have a plan. Uh, the plan has risks attached to it, and we've drawn out some of those risks to be fair, uh, in terms of being able to, uh, to achieve um, uh, rental income from the property investment strategy. We'll be able to drive down um, some big cost, cost drivers, such as homelessness. But uh, we have got a plan, and we've been very clear what that plan is, and we've reported that to members regularly over the last, well, ever since I've been at Rock, actually. Uh, but it isn't without risk, and I, you know, I'm not going to uh, pretend that it is, but we feel that it's something that we can achieve. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I wasn't going to speak, but uh, after Councillor Coleman's little outburst, I, I think either he is peddling misinformation knowingly or he just doesn't understand. We handed over £18.9 million, I believe it was 18.9, around £18 million in reserves. We increased reserves. So during the years of austerity, during 2015 to 2019, we increased reserves. So to suggest that we were using reserves is, at, is actually factually incorrect. And obviously he and Councillor Bayliss are intent on spreading this rumour, uh, misinformation, whatever they're, or, or, or they genuinely don't understand. But being members of the Labour Party, maybe they don't understand. Um, but we increased the reserves. So you inherited... £18 million. Pounds. You can shake your head all you like. You can ask Tony Baden to give you the accounts. It's there in black and white. In black and white, you inherited £18.9 million reserves that we increased when we were last in the administration. No, you don't understand. Oh, it, there's, if you can't understand, you just go and speak to Mr. Braden and he'll explain to you. You inherited £18.9 million pounds of reserves. Out of order, Chair. I don't like being spoken to like a school child. I think that's out of order, Chair. I was civil understand. and polite in my comments. You don't understand what I'm saying. You're saying I'm wrong, and I'm not. I'm right. You're wrong. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I think, yeah, we're, we're going off subject a bit. Councillor uh, Coulter. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm looking at the um, February 2019 budget, the last budget presented by the previous administration. What, can I, can I, we try and get this year's budget. Uh, this I'm, is the one I've, I've come over to, to talk about this year's, but I don't, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not, I don't care about 2019, it's history. So, so we're now on this year's budget, and this is the one that we have got to report to Cabinet with our proposals for this budget. What 2019 budget's got to do with me going to the Cabinet meeting on the 7th of, Jan, of, of uh, February 
and saying, oh, here's our budget, but we spoke about 2019. So, you know, unless you've got a point on this budget, which is what we're supposed to be discussing, then, you know, do do that. But let's, let's stick to the point that we're doing. Comments of this scrutiny committee considered by Cabinet when setting the 22-23 draft budget. Chair, you permitted Councillor Kirby Green to talk about the reserves that have been inherited. Um, in this context, I'd like to um, point out that in consideration of the budget three years ago, you, um, it was showing a reduction in reserves of 3.1 million. It, it was showing a medium-term financial plan projection which, where total usable reserves were going down year on year on year. Now, in this budget, we are um, showing that in years four and five, um, we are increasing the amount going into reserves. Um, it's only, we are turning this round um, after, well, after year three. Um, there's a considerable improvement in 23-24 projected, um, considerable improvement again in 24-25, and but by 25-26 we're in surplus. Um, this is very, very different from the uh, budget presented by the previous administration just before they left office, which showed the total usable reserves going down year on year on year for the whole five years. It really is a misrepresentation of history. Um, what was budgeted for was a year on year use of reserves, which was going to be offset by raising property investment income. I've no stake in this. I was a relative new boy. Uh, I can tell you, reserves went up by seven million. It would have been more, I think, if in fact we hadn't drawn down in that last year's budget. What we were proposing to do, as I understand it, as I say, I was a very new boy, was in fact to generate sufficient property investment income, bridge that gap, so that by this year it would have been down to about half a million, whereas you're budgeting uh, for three point something. And Next year, it would have been down to a quarter. I don't know what the figure you're forecasting for next year, but it's a lot more than the quarter that we were forecasting. Now, I don't want to be particularly political about this. What I'm pointing to is unless you actually get the property investment strategy working and other things working, you are going to be in a mess next year of unbelievable proportions. And I'm actually trying to be helpful to you. Right. Councillor Maynard, I'm sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure you'll be talking very Chairman, well Chairman I, I think, quite frankly, some members around the table here, or one in particular, has forgotten what the purpose of, of the scrutiny committee looking at the budget is. I'm glad he's not in, because the reality is it's not for making part of political broadcasts at scrutiny. It's for actually doing exactly what Councillor Barnes has done, which is to actually make sensible observations on this year's budget. It's about, obviously, feeding in to the budget process, and it, and, it, and it is about, obviously, teasing out any questions that members may have of Tony Baden, and it's about then taking those forward to Cabinet and then Council. This is not the place to... to, to this is not the committee to make party political speeches. This is not the committee to spread misinformation about whatever the previous administration has or has not done. It is about representing the facts, whether they be historic or not. That's not what we've seen this evening, and I hope the Council will reflect on that uh, when the meeting finishes. Well, I think that's what I was trying to say, actually. <laughs> but, um, Councillor Dixon, your Cabinet portfolio holding, we've invited you over to... Uh, Thank you, Chairman. And, and I find myself in the rather uncomfortable position of agreeing with Councillor Maynard that this isn't a political statement. This is, this is where we're going forward. Um, one, one thing I would like to correct, though, 
COVID cost the, this council about half a million pounds in round figures. We didn't have any left over. And, and a lot of that was including a loss of income from things like car parks and such like. So please don't go away thinking that we made money out of COVID because we most certainly didn't. And I think on reflection, what COVID has cost us as well is a year. A year where officers were, were unable to make much progress on a lot of things because they were, they were facing um, sorting out the COVID problems, which is absolutely right. So I think in terms of progress on, on a lot of things, we lost a year from that, and that is as bad as losing the money, really, um, because we're now, we're now you know, up against it a bit more, just as Councillor Barnes does say. I mean, look at, looking at where the, some of the issues were, is at, at the turn of the two administrations, we had the, the waste contract, which immediately cost us an extra million pounds a year. For such a small district council, with, uh, that is an awful lot of money that was, had to be found from nowhere. And in, in fact, we still haven't really found that money yet. And as, as Tony said, that's now going up by 5% as for the contract. Uh, it's, I think it's related to inflation or, or, or some similar measure. So that is, that's what's costing us this year. Councillor Barnes is right that the investment strategy is extremely important. The property investment panel is extremely important. And um, the, the one bit of other disinformation is he, he talks as if we have no plans. Well, of course, we do have plans. The auditors are happy with our plans, and that is most important. You'll remember that we did have um, some big ideas and some, uh, a good project to move a local employer into um, a council-owned building that was going to provide us with rent. Sadly, for a number of reasons, that fell. But that's fallen away for the moment. It's maybe not gone away totally, but it's fallen away from the moment. And that was a big hammer blow to our plans. However, I'm pleased to say that at the next Cabinet meeting, there will be a confidential report, because it's confidential, obviously, I can't talk much about it, that replaces that. And, um, and, and that, I hope, will, will allay a lot of fears that actually this is a, 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 it's an excellent scheme as well that will provide other things other than just uh, an investment for the council. So that is something that we are um, looking forward to progressing very quickly. Cabinet Working Group on, um, uh, on um, protecting services and, and moving services to other councils is, uh, is being established and moving forward. It needs to move forward very quickly. And as I said at Cabinet last week, we have a deadline really of getting that done by this coming December so that um, parish councils, town councils can put any, anything into their parish precepts for the following year. That precept um, setting process really takes place in December and January. There has been a lack of what has been clear as well since, since I've been much more involved is there's been a clear lack of opportunities to, to, to purchase properties for investment purposes. And the rules did change on that, that we weren't allowed to just go out and buy anything. We've had to demonstrate that it was a, a, a benefit to the district, and that has really made life a lot more difficult. Um, it might have made more difficult, I think it's more sensible personally, that we, we invest in the district rather than go and buy properties out of district or out of our area. But it has made life a lot more difficult. But officers are still looking for this, and, and as I said, this, this scheme that will be coming before Cabinet next, next week, or a fortnight, will be that. So... I hope I can allay fears, but we do have plans. There are plans to, to, to um, deal with this deficit. I mean, the, the problem, as I've said many times before, is the council does not have enough money coming in from council tax, and it needs to pay its bills on a, on a, on a um, yearly basis. And this, uh, this is the real issue. We can only put up council tax by a certain amount. We're, we're stymied by that, so we have to find money in from elsewhere. And that's the situation we're in. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, I, think, I think that's um, worth saying. And, and the reminder there that of, of the waste contract as well. Um, I remember that when it came in, which was totally sort of unsurprised. Um, I think we were sort of budgeted about half a million quid and it came in at a million and sort of doubled. So, um, yeah, that took everybody by surprise. So, yeah, I think that's got to be fair. Um, we've got to... Um, we've got to come up with something, I would assume... <laughs> <laughs> um, any comments that this committee can, can give the cabinet, apart from stating the obvious that Councillor Barnes did, that we've got to make more money out of properties uh, and, 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 in, and invest to...
Um, yeah, something else I was going to say. There we go. Um, anybody else? No? Happy with that? I'm, a, I'm afraid I don't think we've solved your problem, Councillor Dixon. <laughs> um, no, you're not. Right, we, we'll leave it to you in a couple of years' time. Um, someone move recommendation, please. Happy, do, we, do I need to move a second on this? I do, don't I? Yep. Um, Councillor Cook, can you move? And Councillor Coleman, second. All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you very much. We'll move on to agenda item eight, page 33. Um, this is a recommendation to council subject to concurrence with the Audit and Standards Committee. Revised financial procedure rules set out in Appendix A be approved and adopted and the Chief Executive be granted delegated authority to make minor changes consequent to the finalisation of the council staffing structure. I think one of these is basically... Um, uh, Tony. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the Council, as, as, all, as do all local authorities, have a set of financial procedures and, and rules that um, we must abide by. <clears throat> and uh, these, uh, these rules are basically an update um, to, uh, to reflect the new staffing structure that we have now in place and hopefully improve operational efficiency. Uh, I won't go through the whole document because it's, uh, it's huge. Uh, Audit and uh, Standards Committee have been, I've been through it with them uh, few weeks ago. So I'll just go through the main changes, Chair, if that helps members. So uh, debt write-offs in um, paragraphs Q4 to Q8, uh, the threshold for members to approve write-offs is significantly increased, uh, which we hope will reduce uh, reporting to members. But um, uh, it is restricted to where the council has no choice. So if it's, uh, I, I do, I, sorry, I, if a firm goes into liquidation, for example. Um, Councillor Kirby Green, at Audit and Standards Committee did ask a question about the sort of level of write-offs that uh, we've experienced in the, in the current financial year. Uh, and the, I think the highest number that we've achieved so far, uh, if achieved is the right word, is uh, £12,000 for business rates write-off. So those limits in the, in the, uh, in the revised procedure should be, should be more than adequate for us. Uh, procurement of services contracts in, in paragraph G35 uh, where a contract exceeds half a million pounds, uh, the draft specification and cost is reported to Cabinet and an overview com and scrutiny committee. Um, Audit and Standards uh, Committee wanted that changed from 500,000 to quarter of a million, um, which that doesn't, as an officer, doesn't, as a chief officer, doesn't cause me any, uh, any problems at all. Um, and establishing subsidiary companies uh, in paragraphs U1 to U10, I had a conversation with Councillor Barnes. Uh, outside of the meeting or via email to suggest a changing to the word uh, in paragraphs 9 and 10 to change the word ensure to assure. Um, hopefully that will cause no, uh, no problems for members either. Um, that's it, Chair. Those are the main changes. Um, any questions on having a chance field? Sorry, this is uh, not something I picked up before on this one, but just a comment on the changing from 500 to 250,000 to service contracts, given the amount of construction work, professional service fees might then, for so things like architects and such, might then fall under that, slowing the pace at which the people can uh, come to terms with that. that that's all really, because they, they tend to be on a percentage of the salary. I think Audit was advised, Chairman, that this limit didn't apply to building contracts, so all right, Tony. I'm not we sure, we felt perfectly safe in bringing it down to two hundred thousand. Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure. Tony may recall his advice to us, but he he felt quite comfortable with two hundred and fifty thousand. I did, chair, but I anticipated the issue that <laughs> Ben's just raised. So. <laughs> Is it worth recommending, Chair, that we bottom, bottom that out before we send it up to Cabinet? It's just, I, I'm not worried about the construction contracts because they won't fall under this, but it's things like architects and, and uh, employers, uh, employers' agents which account as service contracts rather than necessarily 
production contract and therefore may exceed that value because that value has been found in terms of not being uh, there was more than 500 pounds it just it just in terms of being able to bring that in obviously it's the commitment for a review and that's all that's been given it's going to be so rare isn't it that it it i mean all we're doing is saying it needs to be reported through to Tesco. So I can't see the point in saying no. Uh, but it's, um, it's, it's a biggish responsibility for uh, an off take on half a million or so. It seems to uh, our account, uh, sorry, our independent accountant, which I think was quite worried about the size of this. I would assume that if it's gone through audit and standards, then I, I would be happy to follow what they've said. And we have to concur with them for this to go anywhere. So it would be easiest thing for us to do is to, to approve this, concur with all the standards, and then we can have a, a fight for failure and referring back to all the standards. Or, or we go to our cabinet. Uh, Kevin. Well, I, I can see what, what Ben's saying is because the, this means it's got to go to Cabinet, then to scrutiny, then back to Cabinet. So that's two months minimum, and possibly more if it's the wrong time of the year. Is that what we really want to do? Is there not a better way of, of, of ensuring transparency and, and scrutiny, but not actually delaying it by three months? I'm throwing that one back to the office. Yeah, I think that's a Would it matter if we defer this one? Is that going to be? That's not the end of this. Is it? Is it? Is it worth, Chair? We send it up as as agreed by both audit and standards and overview and scrutiny, and then no. we can uh, just simply list the types of contracts that may have fallen under the new one to cabinet and allow them, allow cabinet to make a, a, a judgment based on the recommendation. The recommendations, I think, should go up as stand unaltered and unaffected by by anything that we have to say here. And then we can provide more information at the cabinet meeting on the seventh and say, you know, and it may be that cabinet say, well, say, do you know what's an ethical risk that we that we uh, delay those ones a little bit? As you say, Councillor Barnes, they're not regular regular contracts, but they do crop crop up from time to time. Doesn't go to cabinet; goes to council. Council, well, then 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 we can provide that information to council and. Council to decide. Yeah, Michelle, I mean, additional information. If we approved it going forward now, it's always open to order and standards to consider a fresh amendment um, if, if, in fact, there are real differences. Um, and that might be the best way of doing it rather than us overturn order and standards. I declare an interest as a member of Ordinance Standards, incidentally, but uh, it seems to me let it go forward and then review um, in practice. And if difficulties are coming up, I'm sure Ordinance Standards will be raised in order. Yeah, is there, I know on a previous council I've been on, there's a decision by council, you can't re-look at that decision. So what's the safest thing to do? I, I would I would suggest leave it as is. Leave that. Listen, yeah. Lizzie are comfortable with that, and we can we can we can look at the potential implications and articulate them to the full council. Yeah, and then if it needs amendment to the full council, then we can amend it. Okay. Okay. Um, anyone happy to move this recommendation? Oh, Councillor Dixon. All, all I want to do is point out actually. Um, Part U, which is subsidiary companies, this committee, as well as audit and standards, have, have expressed an interest and the wishing to, um, to look more closely at um, other companies like Alliance Homes Rod that we got. So I'm very pleased to see this is in here, which is a very good way of putting that on paper, that that is what this council intends to do. Okay. Um, who wants to move this recommendation to council? Councillor Charlie Clark and a seconder. Once. Councillor Barnes. All those in favour? 
Miss Carrie, thank you very much. Now then, there we go. That was fit. That was good. Where are we going? Work program. Agenda item nine work program. So 24 for the first is done. So next meeting we've got Crime and Disorder Committee receive a report from the Community Safety Partnership. Hopefully that'll be quick. Um, performance report third quarter, revenue budget, capital program monitoring, and draft anti poverty strategy proposal. Proposal. And then in April, final report recommendation to prosecution review steering group. Um, call the emergency procedures draft annual report to council. I've got written down here environment strategy. Have we got was was, was that coming in there? We was going to look at that every six months or twelve months. Well, I, I, I think something came from Cabinet, didn't it? I'm sure something, a, a recommendation came from Cabinet that should be looked at at least every 12 every months. Month. You, and it was Tommy, asked you, to look back in March last year. Yeah, so, yeah, so we should be possible. Would there be a chance of getting a, 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 a quick look at that in March? If I, if I could, Chair, if we are going to look at it, can I suggest April? April? I think there's a reasonable chance that the final report of the recommendation for the consultation with might not be ready by then anyway. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure of the progress on that. Um, so if, if we are going to do it, I'd prefer to do it a little bit in April. All right. All right, we'll do that. Yeah, get the environment strategy looked at. <coughs> You've got that written down, Louise, just in case anybody tries to wiggle out of it. Absolutely agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think we're happy with, we're probably pretty happy with the rest of it. Any items for consideration for council makers? Uh, yes, Chairman, I'm not sure if this is the place to bring this up, but um, some time ago, and I believe it was at Cabinet, a uh, discussion took place regarding Town Hall Renaissance. And I'm pretty sure that somebody <laughs> pointed out that this has never been by overview and scrutiny. And it still hasn't, and I'm concerned as to where it is sitting at the moment. Uh, Councillor Maiden makes a good point. Uh, it was agreed that when we, before we go, uh, before any further approvals, other than planning, which is a process that we're, we're, we're currently going through, any further approvals would start with overview and scrutiny before going to Cabinet and Council. It will be included in next year's work programme, <coughs> i.e. from June onwards, which is when we anticipate being able to bring um, something with detail and note to this committee for proper, for proper oversight and scrutiny, uh, rather than before. So um, you're probably looking sort of uh, July time, but obviously we don't set the work program for the next specific year until until we know who's going to be on the committee. So it will it will come up in the work program probably for July for your for the week of April to July next year. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? No? All done? Right. Thank you very much for your attendance. I declare the meeting closed at 27 minutes past eight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.